soil pH, I think you could argue, is more important than the texture of your soil, how you choose to add fertilizers, all the way to the water and everything else in between. It is literally the make it or break it for what nutrients is being uptaken by your plant. So today's video, I'm going to show you guys how to change your soil pH on a mass scale, whether you need it more acidic or more alkaline. I'm going to show you the cheapest ways to do this and the most effective based on science. So let's get into it. All right, so number one, you guys probably watched my video on how to test what pH your soil is at and you probably noted that mine was at a 7 to a 7.5. Now this is outside of the range that we want which is the 6.5 and while it doesn't seem like a big jump when it's 0.5 of the scale it actually is quite drastic and you're going to figure that out very quickly when you go to actually begin adjusting your soil pH. A 0.1 is a big deal because it takes a lot of oomph to get that soil chemistry to switch over. Now, the even more unfortunate part about changing your soil chemistry is that you're gonna be doing it forever because your soil naturally is always going to push itself back to its base, its natural set point, if you will. And this is because of many different factors from the parent material of your soil to the soil texture that you may have you name it. And because of that, you need to continually test. So fall and spring are two of the best times to actually do this test, particularly if you know you're on more of the acidic side and you're trying to bring it to the more alkaline side because you can begin to amend this here in the fall. Now, the second thing to think about is I did show you guys way back how to test your soil pH using vinegar and baking soda without having to use a kit. And now this is a good barometer for giving you a general descriptor for for where you sit, either alkaline or acidic, is not a great indicator as to whether or not you should adjust your soil. If you have a soil that is representing acidity based on the tests that you did, then I would highly encourage you to get a kit and actually physically test and test. I just, I want to warn you guys against really nearly changing your soil pH because it, just because it's, it is important and changing it <laughs> too far one it way uh, it can be a little bit heartbreaking and difficult to correct lickety split my hands are so frozen i can't even snap lickety split okay so first let's look at soil that is too acidic and we're trying to bring it to the more alkaline side so this is anything that is below the 6.5 the exception to this is acid loving plants we're not going to talk about those we're going to talk about just your your usual plants now the ways that soil can become acidic is actually via fertilizers misuse of them or over application prolonged application all the way to actually the natural ph of the water that comes out of the tap so if you have a more acidic water that's being put onto your soil it will actually bring that soil ph down and if you're using fertilizers particularly ammonium sulfate or urea for example as your nitrogen source that will also continue to acidify your soil so number one is actually to look at what your tap water is and if it is out of whack you could try to adjust it but that's a lot of work so maybe not and then the other option is to look at your fertilizers and read the labels see if it says a, 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 a urea See if it says urea or if it says ammonium sulfate. If either one of those are your nitrogen source, you wanna go for nitrate rather than those two. So find a fertilizer that says nitrate as the nitrogen source. Okay, so now we know preventively what we have to do. Let's look at what we need to add physically to the soil. So there are two options. There's calcitic, calcitic lime and then there is dolomite lime okay so dolomite and calcitic calcitic lime are two that to be honest work relatively the same the difference is with the dl is it tends to take longer it's not as explosive in how quickly it increases the ph and it isn't necessarily more sustained and because of that you could argue that maybe it's not the best choice the other one which is the cl you 
see a more rapid increase. It's actually much faster in increasing your pH. And while it's gradual, it's also considered more stable. Now there are price point differences, so keep that in mind. But when it comes to application and knowing how much you need to use or get, uh, because that will obviously factor into which one you go with, if you're concerned about cash and how much it's gonna cost. And I'm gonna link this chart down below. So what you need to know is your starting point for your pH, where you want to go in regards to pH, what your surface area is, and what your soil texture is. If you don't know what your soil texture is, you're gonna have to watch this video here because that is going to be very important in determining. That ratio or that number that you get is really important and is a great starting point. And when it comes to making your soil more alkaline, you can begin that process here in the fall. And then I would retest in the spring to see where you're at, and then add as necessary. Now, the other side of this is soil that is alkaline that you need to make more acidic. This one tends to be a little bit more finicky. If you're in the prairies or if you're in an arid area, you're gonna fall into this category. And that's just because of mother nature doing her thing. Now, where I am, my water pH is at an eight. And so my soil tends to suffer under irrigation. That is because like we discussed before, prolonged exposure to soil under a specific pH will edge your soil to that direction. And so it will become more alkaline over time. Okay, so I don't explain this super well in this video. So we're gonna just insert this now. Buffering capacity. Now this is spoken about loosely throughout the entire video, but not truly explained. So when I'm referencing texture for example soil texture the reason why i say you need to figure out what the soil texture is is because your soil buffering capacity increases or decreases based on that so for example if you have a clay soil this is a higher cation exchange capacity aka a higher buffer meaning whether you're going down or you're going up you need to add more product. Now the opposite is sand. So sand has a lower buffering capacity, AKA a lower cation exchange capacity, and therefore needs less product to go up or to go down. The other thing that has a buffering capacity that is only found in soils that are usually too alkaline and need to be brought down in acidity is calcium carbonate aka lime so if you have a parent material that is derived from limestone such as the prairies or your tap water great indicator of whether or not you have limestone your tap water is higher in ph more alkaline eight ish or more i don't know if people have that but i'm at an eight Another indicator of you being in an area where your parent material is going to be lime and therefore you're going to have a higher buffering capacity. So that's what makes more alkaline soils. That's what makes alkaline soils more, more difficult. If you have an alkaline soil high in calcium carbonate combined with clay soil texture or, or a, a clay loam, something to that effect, it, it just ramps it up even more. So, I mean, keep that in mind. I always am concerned with the geek crew when I leave off on that note that you guys are going to get worried that you're doomed to garden because you have a high buffering capacity. I made it sound negative. Let me just, it's not negative. It's not negative. Buffering capacity that is high is actually a good thing. That is why the prairie provinces, the, the literally the belt that goes from Canada into the US for egg is so fertile it has to do with this high buffering capacity because that high buffering capacity makes that soil more resistant to external inputs causing changes so while it's negative in the sense that it's difficult to change the ph it's positive because of how stable it is for plants so if i had to choose having something with a low buffering capacity versus a higher buffering capacity i'm always going to go with the higher buffering capacity no, also keep in mind like for toxicity or um like in the form of like micronutrients or like actual toxins higher buffering capacity again it it helps with keeping things safe so it's not a negative thing it's just it's difficult to change so don't deem it as negative now making my 
what are more acidic is difficult right out of the tap. But one way I can make it more acidic is with fertilizer. So when we use fertilizers on our soils that are more alkaline, we can use ammonium sulfate or urea to actually bring that soil pH down. Now this is gradual, it takes time, but the good news is that continual exposure is going to be the secret. Now the good news is that continual exposure is going to be incredibly important when it comes to making your soil more acidic. When it comes to physical products that are solely responsible for decreasing the soil pH, we look at usually elemental sulfur. Now this can come in little tiny discs, which you guys have seen me use on this video before, and I'll link them down below, all the way to a powdered form. And again, the same rules apply. You're going to use a chart to determine your starting point, where you want to be, and your soil texture to determine how much elemental sulfur you need to add. Now, the unfortunate part is sulfur is one of the 17 essential nutrients and it is considered a secondary macro. So it's up there with calcium and magnesium. However, it is mobile in our soil, which means it's water soluble and it is very easily moved through our soil profile under rain, melt, snow, etc. So what this means, regardless of whether you choose to use fertilizers or you choose to use elemental sulfur, sulfur, or you could use citric acid too. Now citric acid is another option you could go with that's not elemental sulfur. And obviously this is an acid that will help bring that pH down. It brings it down much quicker, but it is not sustained, meaning it brings it down to a range, but it begins to creep up after that if you're not utilizing the right technique. So citric acid is isn't my favorite option. Elemental sulfur is powdered or the actual physical little discs. So because sulfur is mobile in the soil, it is very easily washed away. So where we are in Canada, putting it in the soil right now is not going to work for us because when things rain, thaw, it's all just gonna get washed out. So when it comes to acidifying the soil, what you wanna do or what the prescription would be is to test it now, get an idea of where you sit, put a game plan in over the winter, and then try to tackle said game plan in the spring. Now, I would be on the conservative end. I wouldn't go too crazy with the soil. Uh, in regards to elemental sulfur and what you add, I would do it within the prescription. And then after that, continue to use ammonium sulfate or urea-based fertilizers to try to force that down. The, the secret with soil that is on the alkaline side that you're trying to make more acidic is just continual repeated exposure to acidic water. Simple as that. Now with both sets, whether you're going for basic or acidic, you need to incorporate it into the soil. So whether it's the dolomite lime, the calcitic lime, the elemental sulfur, this all needs to be incorporated into your soil. So don't just broadcast it on the surface. You need to take the time to double dig it or put it in by hand. And in particular, get it in and around the rhizosphere or the root zone. For you to just put it in the top couple inches, it's not going to benefit you, particularly if you're dealing with some deeper rooted plants. Now, obviously when you water, and in the case of sulfur, even more specifically, because it's so easily leached through the soil system, it will begin to pull some of that down and will alter the pH lower in that soil system or in that soil profile. But ultimately speaking, you cannot broadcast. You cannot just use this on a no dig. Now, if you're inexperienced, there are some things I want you to stay away from. That is wood ash because this one is very hit and miss as to the concentration of what's in there. I also want you to use caution when it comes to using compost or peats. These typically do not do anything in either direction. And so I don't want you to waste your hard earned money on a bunch of bags of peat because it's probably not gonna do much other than increase organic material, which I mean, does, does work, it does matter. And if you're dealing with a soil that is, I'm gonna say organic because that's like the soil science verbiage we use for a soil that is very high in organic material, not necessarily like organic in like the, what you eat anyways, organic soil profiles or if you have a heavy clay soil profile, if it takes a lot of product or time or effort, that is normal. Do not get discouraged. Sandier soils, silty loams, sandy loams are gonna be able to turn this ship around much quicker 
regardless of what end of the spectrum they're on, than someone that is an organic soil and or a soil that's high in clay. So just keep that in mind. And like I said, you don't know what your soil texture is. You've got to check out this video here. And that's what Google's telling you to watch. So I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.